my goodness. <laughs> Is, oh it my- Is it gone? Is it Yes! Yes, she screwed it up. I love it. Oh, this is too perfect. Turn it, turn it, turn it. Welcome in to a casual Friday edition of the DMV Podcast. <laughs> Presented as always by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top rated sportsbook app. Use promo code DNVR whenever you sign up. Let me help Marissa out. We got a special producer, Marissa, there. She doesn't know any of the buttons or controls. She's uh, she's drowning over there. I can see her behind the screen, just absolutely drowning. Uh, we got a great show for you guys today. I'm feeling it. Friday vibes, casual. Um, you guys notice anything different about me? Uh, I'm gonna say hair. Uh, I'm gonna say uh, new T-shirt. Gosh, you guys are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> a new color of the wall. Yeah. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! 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 Is it is it the green screen? <laughs> it looks like it. It almost does. It's uh like it's called Ocean Floor, Miroslav. If you were wondering, Ocean mm-hmm. Floor. Uh, which brings out the color and texture of my skin, I think, very nicely, wouldn't you say, Vote? Yeah, you look great, man. I was going to say, did you get tan? But I should have known. You just painted your walls. I don't know why that wasn't my first guess. <laughs> That's how this works, man. I look so much more beautiful, of course, over here uh, now in this new one. You're going to have to hop on the live stream if you're listening to this as a podcast, as many of you do. You're going to have to hop on the live stream so you can see our beautiful setups. Uh, I'm joined by a great cast today down there, uh, dressed like a mime. It's Brennan Vote. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I'm like, all right, neutral colors, like, you know, just like a standard outfit. <laughs> I guess I do look like a mom. Skip me. Go to Harrison. <laughs> Over here in an undisclosed location, it's Harrison Wind. I'll just tell you guys it's Los Angeles. He's in Los Angeles. He's in, he's in uh, that's actually incorrect. I'm not in Los Angeles. So oh, you're wrong. You? I, I can't tell you. Actually. It's undisclosed. <laughs> Uh, right. Not and even close they- to Los Angeles, but um, I do have to say quick shout out to Bryn Forbes, the last Nuggets player to ever wear number six. <laughs> so funny. What a ridiculous story. The I, I, we, we should talk about that here in a second. Well, let me just get through this. We've also got our Serbian homie and our spiritual guide and also physical guide through Serbia, Miroslav Chuk. So, Adam, are you telling me that you're wasting my talents on DNVR 2 channel? <laughs> I mean, you, you know I'm a TV personality, man. The I mean, I a TV so casual, so casual, this is so casual. The thing I love about Miroslav is he like. I don't. When, when do you come up with your opener? Is it Monday? Is it Wednesday? <laughs> like Friday morning. When do you get these? That you're, comes up you're with it on ready? Monday, then workshops it on Wednesday. Comes out with the final product Friday. Yeah. Yeah, it's good when you have only one appearance per week that you you can you can really work on your act. <laughs> unlike you guys. Sure. Uh, it should also be noted, Miroslav's going to be back with Voya, right? You and Voya tomorrow doing a yep, tomorrow at two p.m. Two p.m. Don't forget while while you're having your lunch or whatever, you just don't want to 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 miss that show. It, it will be way better than this one. Right now, <laughs> Probably, I imagine Probably it will. Fair. A little bit later in the show, guys. There's been some news. Um, over the last couple of days, 24 hours or so, John Wallace is departing Denver and going with Tim Conley to Minnesota. Same goes for his brother, Joe Conley. I don't know. Nuggets letting Joe Conley go to Tim Conley. How did, I wonder how they, how did the Timberwolves able to steal Tim Conley's brother? I don't know I'm how hearing. they did it. Um, but I want to talk about those because I think they're both interesting you know, developments. John Wallace in particular, I think a bit of a rising star. So we'll talk about that in segment three, as well as some other random news and notes. Segment two, Serbian corner. I have no idea what we're doing. Miroslav has that one planned for us. Perfect. But I thought I would start today's casual Friday, deep off season, with a little bit of update for, on our trip. I know last week we kind of announced it and, and we talked about some of the initial thoughts to it. But now things are starting to come together. And I have to first say, the last week has been incredible. It's been absolutely incredible because as we announced, you know, that we're going to, to Serbia and sort of the loose idea, what is the trip about? What are we doing? Why, why are we doing this? So many people have started to reach out, like more people than I can handle have reached out to say like, hey, I can show you this. I can do this. I can do it. And I appreciate it so much. And a lot of our trip now is being formed by that very sort of spirit. People, people saying, hey, I think it's cool. Either we'd love to meet you so we can do this together or, hey, I have some advice for you here here and there. So I thought it would be cool just to kind of share what's going on. What do you guys think? Does it sound good to you? Vote, you look almost bored over there. So I just want to make sure this out. Does it sound good? Some details no, no. on this trip. Please mime your answer. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> By the way, have you guys noticed? Look at Vote. Miroslav, would you say Vote has looked 
thinner and more attractive since you saw him two weeks ago? Would you say he is preparing for this trip? So handsome, so handsome. I'm, I'm, I'm barely, you know, keeping my me out of his space. Yeah, I'm getting hot as a bit, as a bit. <laughs> <laughs> He's so dedicated to his craft over there. Um, so as I mentioned the last time, first of all, I want to tell you who's going on this trip. We of course know that the four of us will be there. Miroslav lives there, but the three of us will be there: Dev, Eric, Kale, and uh, and RG documenting the entire experience. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole host of people that are in this world, including of course Miroslav, who will be there. Uh, Milan, who is a former co-host of Serbia Nugget Serbia. I know he's still on from time to time, but you know he hosts alongside. He's been on this show. You guys know him. He'll be joining us. I think a lot of people, if you interact a lot in the Nuggets online universe so you, you perhaps have met Serjan, who's going to be uh you know with us for a portion of the trip as well uh kind of guiding us and i think that you know that's going to be great and then a whole host of people that i hope you get to know throughout this trip some of whom are going to be guiding us through i know we have a guided tour on our first day uh there from a dnvr super fan shouts to goran who I look forward to meeting, who's going to take us around some different places and give us the lay of the land as we arrive, which I think will be absolutely fantastic. He's a professional tour guide, so this mm-hmm. isn't just like Miroslav, who's giving us the worst <laughs> Serbian facts possible, the, Dr. Pooper or whatever it was. Uh, he, an actual tour guide uh, of the city, which is going to be great. And again, our hope is to take you along with it. So you too will feel like you're getting a tour of the city of Serbia, which I think will be absolutely, or of Belgrade, which I think will be absolutely great. Um, beer fest vote. How does it sound to what, what would you guess beer fest is? Well, my first guess, Adam, is a lot of drinking. Uh, uh, I could be wrong on that. I what I don't know is what's it going to be like. What's the mix here? The ratio of like fair, we're showing off our product versus like competition and games versus straight club atmosphere. I don't know. In I don't know this particular beer fest what to expect. I do know that I am going to enjoy it. <laughs> it's funny because I get the sense, and I almost don't want to know. Like some of these things I want to be prepared for, and some of them I don't. This is one I don't want to be prepared for. I kind of just want to arrive. Uh, right. I get the sense more of a concert than a actual beer festival where you're going to be like tasting a million different beers. I, I feel like too. beer fest is just a better selling point, I, I gather, than like music fest. Uh, I think I think yeah. this might be it. Harrison, yeah. um, what type of music are you most excited? What's, what, what band are you most excited to see at Beer Fest? Uh, Chainsmokers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm excited to hear music that I've never heard in my life. If I hear one American song, I'm going to be severely disappointed. I, I want to hear nothing <laughs> that I've heard before. Do you have a, a, a festival persona, Harrison? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> Usually involves me wearing a throwback NBA jersey, um, a fanny pack, sunglasses. <laughs> hey, that's serious. Like, I'm you thinking get, about bringing a fanny pack on this trip. I'm like, just practical. Dude, I think it fanny the fanny sense. packs are, are the most underrated accessory. I will I will have to say, like super underrated, especially if you're traveling to a foreign place where you want to keep your important documents right where you can get to them. You know, Miroslav, true or false? bags side bags popular in serbia that's what i hear that's what i hear yes side bag i i i wear a side bag or a oh. man purse oh <laughs> immersed those know. are very european i gotta say yeah yeah i i used to wear fanny pack for years and years and then people just told me come on man you you look like like you're you're selling on a flea market so so i just started the, the, that side bag Thing with right. me, and I hate bag? it so much because it really is making me problems while I'm driving and and such things. I need to take it off every time. I really put it on my my passenger seat, seat and and so on. So, uh, yeah, it's it's uncomfortable, but it's it's really useful because you know I have a I have a huge wallet because I'm a very rich guy. Right. So I, I need to a lot put of it cash, in, yeah. In, in, yeah, yeah, a lot of cash. So cash I need to put it you know somewhere. Safe. American dollars too, yeah. No, all all yeah. kinds of currencies, really. So, so ridiculous. Keeping it moving here. Um, so we're gonna arrive. Get <laughs> you know, that one. So we're gonna arrive in Friday, um, and and then Saturday, as I mentioned, we're gonna have a meetup. I believe near the fortress. We'll have an exact location, but if you're in Belgrade or around it, we really hope that you come out and join us. Uh, I have no idea how many people 
people to expect for this meetup, but I'm hoping it's a lot. There's no number limit. I want, we're only going to be in Belgrade, I imagine, once. I don't know if we're going to get to do Serbia Trip 2.0. I would love to at some point, but I kind of doubt we will. So this is our real chance to meet everybody that's been following along the show. We always say we feel so connected to our audience and our audience, audience feels connected to us. So to be able to put faces to some of the names we see is going to be absolutely great. Um, and that'll be Saturday. And then we'll go to Beer Fest on Saturday. So Friday night, I'm not sure what we'll do, but Saturday – We'll meet up with everybody for a couple hours and then go to Beer Fest. And if people want to come to Beer Fest with us um, and, and extend the, the night all the way into the early hours of the morning, if it should be, that seems to be our plan. Um, the rest of the trip after that, we're going to be having interviews. One of the goals of this trip, obviously, to take you guys along with us on this experience and, and kind of share it with you. But one of the other goals is to learn more about Nikola Jokic, his backstory. And we have some great guests lined up for us to do that. And hopefully tell stories you've ne that you've never heard before, at least told to an American audience about some of the origin stories of Nikola Jokic. But another thing we want to do is figure out what is it? Why are Serbians so good at basketball? Like, why is it that there's so many people in the NBA come from the Balkan regions? What is it about? And, and in what ways does their culture affect and, and their history and their development and their, all of those things, do they affect Serbia? And where should we have, expect Serbian basketball to go from here? And we have, I think, some of the best guests possible to answer both of those questions in what will ultimately become an extended vlog or documentary style show, probably 30 to 45 minutes show about our trip and about that topic. How have we become connected to Serbia through our show and through our experience with Nicola? But then again, what has this experience taught us? about this region of the world, and in particular about why they are so good at basketball. And I think it's going to be a great story, and I think we have some great names, big-time names that are going to help us tell that story, and I'm really, really excited for it. So Sunday through Thursday during the daytime, that's going to be a majority of what we're doing is working on that, those pieces of it. So that's why I say when we arrive Friday, Saturday, those are going to be the best days to kind of catch up with us. I'm, I'm really excited about the part where, where these guys will uh, talk about the future of Serbian basketball because I've heard some really smart people uh, saying completely opposite things. Really? Like, we are a really a divided nation on what's going on hmm. with Serbian basketball in future. And in present, to be honest. Well, it's interesting, Miroslav, because first of all, no spoilers. Obviously, we're starting to do some research, but... You know, Argentina, for example, I know we probably still have some hanger on Argentinian fans, even though Faku's not here. They had a golden generation that was a little bit of a flash in the pan. And I don't mean that derogatory. I just mean that they had a peak, a 15-year peak of players that all kind of come from the same generation. But it has it to your point and maybe a concern some people share about Serbia. Are we just in a peak right now where all these great players are coming from the Balkan region, but it's sort of a one-off and it might fizzle out? That's one of the questions I want to ask. I think probably not. There's a deeper history that goes back even 50, 60 years with Serbian success in basketball, unlike, per, say, Argentina. But I think it's interesting to ask. And one of the things we've said is everybody knows what a New York point guard is. It's You say a point guard from New York has a very specific thing to him. What does it mean to be a Serbian basketball player specifically? And I think that's the thing that is a story, at least I've never seen told to an American audience. And I want to tell that exact story as best I can. Um, there are two events, though, where you might be able to join us later on in the week. The first one, it looks like, this one isn't certain, but it looks pretty certain, that we will be at the Red Star Playoff Soccer Game, which I hear is... Hell yeah. Miroslav, you can fill me in. Red Star Playoff <laughs> Soccer Game. People have told me you got to go because it's going to be crazy, but don't sit in the fan section. It, it'll be too crazy. Yeah, it, it, uh, uh, when you say a playoff game, it, it just it doesn't give it, uh, enough justice to the game. It's a super important game because if they win in a, in a two-match clash against uh, the team they're playing against, they will qualify for the, for the uh, what's the name, Champions League. And Champions League brings a shitload of cash to a club, it, it, it makes a huge difference in what the club will be able to do in years that come after this year. So it's super, super important. I, I, I don't care what will happen because I'm not a Red Star fan, but I am going to, to join you and pretend I'm, I'm enjoying myself. So yeah, <laughs> go, go Crvena Zvezda. It's so funny, man. Um, I might become a Red Star fan off of this. I mean, I need my partisan people to step up right now. I mean, 
Red Star, we're going to have some good. Miroslav <laughs> takes himself off. Um, some of the people, or, or at least one of the people that we're going to be interviewing for this basketball documentary is connected to Red Star, and, I'm, and it should be a fantastic guest. So I'm, I'm excited for that and to learn about that. But this game, the soccer game, should be a lot of fun um and, and another one so if you're going to that game reach out say hey let's meet up maybe beforehand we can have some drinks before going into the arena to get wild should i not do a fan vote at that game or like <laughs> i think the, the temperature, temperature might be like lost like on yeah mocking lost. strangers in that environment what do you think? yeah you should just like have a disclaimer no flares on the fan <laughs> Then look, I, th I think you'd be good. Then look for family people. You know, just yeah. just Go the scan, scan carefully. Yeah. Scan carefully. Look for children. Yeah. Um, By the way, Adam, I don't want to interrupt you. To to Jack Bailey, it's a sweatshirt and a hat. It's a very neutral, unoffensive outfit. I did not think inspector. I would get mocked for this twice today. What does a food <laughs> inspector even look like? I don't know, but it sounds right. It is very funny. Um, and the other thing, of course, is going to be the game between Jokic and and Giannis, who I don't know if you've been paying attention, Miroslav, but Giannis is rough is averaging roughly one point five points per minute in, in European play this summer. Um, I'm already in a group chat with a Bucks fan just for something else, and I'm already can tell if Jokic's first, you know tune-up game if he does not score 30 points in 20 minutes i'm gonna hear an earful for it Giannis looks pretty good yeah sure it's it's a preparation game so don't give anything to that i mean what we call these games is friendlies but it has nothing to do with being friendly it's about trying out stuff like like a summer summer league game yeah. so don't read in into it at all uh i'm not sure how how high the form of of Serbian team will be for that match against Yanis and Greece? I hope they will they will be in a pretty good shape for that, because Coach Pesic will give him trouble with defense. So I don't expect Yanis to score one and a half point per minute against Serbia in a qualifying game. If they meet up, you know, in a in a friendly game as we call it. I'd, I just, just don't care about this. I will say this, though. This is one thing we've talked about with Giannis that I love about him is he does seem to take every game as if it's, you know, so important, whether it's regular sure. season or what. So as much as it is dumb when it's an actual non-meaningless game, a friendly, as you, if you will, it's still funny. It's still cool to me that he always is like, you know what? If I'm going to be out there, I'm going to play. Could, could you give us just a little update on on the recent happenings around the, the Serbian team? Because th there's been some news, right, Miroslav, in terms of who's on the team and who, who's getting cut in. What's just what's the word? What, what's the word on the Serbian team right now? Yeah, well, well, we'll Voya and I will talk about this in deep tomorrow at 2 p.m. Remember, guys, a much more important show than this one. <laughs> but sure. Before that, I'll just tell you one thing that that that's a big that was like a big bomb out of Serbian uh, headquarters is that Milos Teodosic, the uh, long-lasting captain of the team, will not be playing at the Eurobasket. And uh, for people that don't connect to basket too hard, it's it's a big shock. It's a mm. big shock. On the other hand, we had a very similar situation with Coach Pesic twenty years ago when he cut the Alexander Djordjevic, who was also the team captain before that, who was also 35 at the time, and he said, I needed a, some other guys if I, I want to, to, to win this thing. So this is what, what Coach Pesic did this time around also. Milos Teodic is 35. Even when he was a 25-year-old player, he wasn't a great defender. So if you want to guard in space, and you have Nikola Jokic behind you, you want a guy that can hunt your your opponents. So I think it's a very solid decision by by Coach Pesic. Of course, I would prefer if it happened in a nicer way because Mil Milos actually spent a week with the team before he got cut. He just shouldn't have been called at all at the first place and that it, everything would be cool mm -hmm. in that situation. We also have one more injury to report uh, Alex Avramovic, who is a backup point guard. And that's that's a tough thing because we are pretty pretty um, uh, tight now at the point guard position. He's a guy with great motor. He's not a super big superstar, but he would be a very useful player for the Eurobasket. Unfortunately, we will not have him. With with mm. Milos out, I mean, I'm kind of curious. Last time Jokic played, he was the young pup, 
I mean, it's been several years, but he was the young pup who was also just so talented, probably the best player, but he was a young pup. Do you feel with Milos out that there is an opportunity or maybe even an expectation for Nikola to be the team's leader? I mean, obviously he'll be the best player. I think he's the best player in the world. But is there an expectation now that this is sort of in a weird way his team? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think Co Coach Pesic will be empowering him if he is reluctant to take this kind of uh, obligation. And this is definitely a Nikola Jokic team. And uh, he is really high on Vasa Micic as well. Mm -hmm. So I expect actually those two guys to be the leaders of, of this, this tournament. Mirs, this we, we obviously, on this side of the pond, there's news of Jovic not be, getting permission to play. And that is seemingly a big deal to us. To, from your perspective, how integral was he to what the team wanted to do, potential success, and so on? Excellent question. Because uh, I, I spoke to, to our guys, Ray and Peter and Jared on Four Corners uh, podcast a couple of days ago. And they asked me, what do I think about the NBA's influence on, on the worldwide basketball? And I, I told them it's a really bad influence when you get all of these international stars going at the age of 18, 19 to the NBA because NBA teams have such a control over these young guys. They are not really allowed to tell them you're not allowed to play on the Eurobasket, but they can tell them like if you want to compete for the roster spot next year you probably should be on time for the training camp. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, so imagine Pat Riley being like, so you're not really going to play for uh, Serbia this summer. And that, that's a terrible thing because Vlade Divac used to play for the national team at the age of 18. Predak Danilovic used to play for the national team at the age of 19. And these guys really got a bump in their careers because mm -hmm. they've been able to play throughout the year for the national team and for the clubs, uh, either in Europe or in the NBA. Vlade Divac was actually the first... NBA star ever to play at the Eurobasket back in uh, 1989. Oh, I, I mean, Mir Miroslav, how, how many times do we talk about USA players like right. leveling yep. up because they played in the Olympics with the Absolutely. national team? For sure. I, I even think I, we can be specific about Nikola. I feel like that 2017 yeah. time with Serbia propelled him to a new height, not because of how he performed, which he was great, but I think you could have expected it. But I think in the ways he was great, the way he was, was received even when he came back home, I think it was mm -hmm. one of those ones where it was like, I actually am that guy. I imagine for him, he would never, I don't think, answer this one. But I do think there was a recognition going against – it's funny. Do you know who he went against as centers in that – against Team USA? DeMarcus, oh, uh, DeMarcus Kansas, I think. And, and DeAndre Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we backup centers of past and present. Um, that's who he went up against. But the fact that he dominated the way that he did in that one to me was sort of an arrival of for him, even in his mind of like, I'm actually in tier one, mm. like, and I, and I can go for that. And when you said that he was a young pup, that was actually about the 2016 Olympics, because next time he played in 2019, uh, world cup, he wasn't a young pup, but there was oh, this, gotcha. this strange dynamic between him and the other stars of the team. And, it really wasn't his team, so I think that was one of the biggest reasons why Serbia didn't, you know, win the gold medal on that championship, or at least played in the finals against Spain and then whatever. But this time around, I mean, Coach Besic really uh, leveled the field around Nikola, you know, and he said, "I'm, I'm waiting for him to, 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 to give us that extra quality that we need to compete for the medals." And that's it. It's it's a really smart approach. This is why I'm so excited for this, you know, for these games in particular. Is I actually feel like if you think about what does Nicola need training camp for? He needs for the other players can learn how to be developed around him. You know, like Michael Porter needs Jokic in training camp, but Jokic doesn't need anybody else. But what he does need is leadership. But I do feel like this is a weird training camp for him, even though it's its own thing. It's a weird training camp for him in leadership. Like he needs to seize powers and you know, for lack of a better phrase, during this event and really lead this team in those ways. And I'm curious to see that challenge and then also how that going right from that into training camp with the Nuggets where he needs to do much the same thing. Even though he already has that dynamic established more, it still, I think, will be a cool thing for him. So I'm really excited for that. Let's take a break. Oh, the other thing I was going to tell you is, you know, our old friend Tim Conley has set us up actually with uh, some great people in the food industry in, in Belgrade. So in addition, we were going to have... 
all different types of food. And we want to share that experience with you guys as we're doing it. But we are also probably have some really nice and interesting meals uh, to present and to really learn about Serbian food culture together, which I think will be a lot of fun. So um, let's take a break. On the other side, Miroslav has a final presentation for us in the last edition of Serbian Corner before our trip. Ivaka is the new goat in Colorado sports. That is the greatest of all TV. Ivaka TV delivers amped up sports coverage for Colorado fans featuring Altitude Sports, AT&T Sportsnet, the NFL Network as well. Wow, NFL Network. Get the most regional content for the lowest price for sports in Colorado, all in crystal clear HD while using less bandwidth and enjoy over 60 entertainment channels, including news, movies, and much more. Turn your home into the ultimate game viewing zone. You can even stream your teams from your phone, laptop, or tablet when you're on the go. You can also add on a discounted Sling TV bundle to get ESPN and more as well. Evoca is only $25 a month plus a $5 receiver fee. But right now, Colorado sports fans can get $10 off per month for the first three months. To get this deal, go to evoca.tv slash Colorado 10. Evoca.tv slash Colorado 10. No contracts, no hidden fees. I've, Evoca TV is made for champions of the remote. Also, right now at DraftKings Sportsbook, guys, Get in on the hottest sports action for your shot at cold, hard cash with DraftKings Sportsbook. Bet on your favorite sports all summer long. And gear up for football season. It's football season, guys. we got preseason football going on right now. New customers can get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. Just make your first bet up to $1,000. If it doesn't hit, you'll get another shot at a big win. Plus, with same-game parlays, spreads, money lines, over-unders, and props, you're getting betting options that are endless Best of all, DraftKings is safe, secure, reliable, deposit and withdraw cash whenever you want. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, use code DNVR, make your first deposit, get a risk-free bet to $1,000. That's code DNVR only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Colorado only. New customers only, minimum $5 deposit. Risk-free bet paid out in the form of non-withdrawable free bet token, max $1,000. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem, call 1 800 522 4700. All right, Miroslav, go ahead and take the wheel here. What is it you have presented for us today? Welcome to the Serbian Corner. <laughs> the last one, and uh, <clears throat> I needed to save this one for the last ones because, you know, if it wasn't the last one, it would be the last one if you catch my drift. So <laughs> you asked me for how long I, I prepare for my bits here. Is it a week? Is it a couple of days? Some of the questions you're going to get in this segment, I've, I've written like two years ago. <laughs> what? Yeah, I actually, I actually found an email I sent to myself two years ago, some, somewhere around two years ago. And I was, I was preparing for Stepanice. Stepanice, the steps. In Serbia. <laughs> yes. Okay. Can, can we get this, the step, step in its music from me? in the oven for two years, no. fellas. Buckle up. <laughs> All right. Okay. So since I'm not as evil as Harrison or Brandon, I'm going to give you four choices for each question. And I'm not going to throw you out of the studio permanently when you get it wrong. <laughs> you will take a one question break and then return. I can't but believe this. Okay. If you make three consecutive misses, you're out, baby. Wow. So, okay. <laughs> so let's start with something easy. Uh, like something like a, a Harrison's first question would be question number one. And this is for Brandon. Wow. Brandon, famous American Serbian scientist born one. in Smiljan in Austro Hungarian Empire, Nikola Tesla, had a lab in oh. Thornton, Broomfield. Boulder or Colorado Springs? Man, my uh, my um, transplant is showing so hard. Oh, too easy, and he is gonna get it wrong. <laughs> Bad am. vote, disappointing. Um, D. D is correct. He got it. Wow. D is correct. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you know, Gordon F of you, the gods. That's F you guys. This is a beautiful place. I mean, this is this is just awesome. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. You're not coming. Is, is that Colorado Springs? 
<laughs> I don't know. I know it I, said Colorado <laughs> Springs on Google. I have no idea. I know. I mean, if the Red Rock does look like the Maybe Manitou the area, gods, maybe it's Garden of the Gods. Hard to say. I don't That's know what the rest of the city looks like. <laughs> Question number two for Harrison. The only basketball player in history to win FIBA World Cup gold medal and marry Adriana Lima <laughs> is Vlade Divac, Predrag Stojakovic, oh my God. Marko Jaric, or Miloš Teodosic. Marko I, Jaric. I don't know this. Man, it's got to be don't... Marko. He's the better looking of all of them. Although Peja, the richest of all of them, I believe. I mean, it's not Vladi. I think we know that. Like, I love Vladi, but come on, bro. Well, I don't know uh, who Adriana um, Lima is. Should I know that? Should I know this person? Adriana Lima is a – she's a 10, bro. Uh, <laughs> I'd but, say – But she watches the DNBA show, so she's a 6. <laughs> I don't know, man. He's too good at this. Thanks, man. No, that's that's not how the joke works. <laughs> it worked perfect to me. She's a 10 because she watches. Uh, I'll, I'll say Marco Yarch. Marco Yarich is correct. Yeah, he's and a good look at this. Guy. Look, look at this mustache. I mean, only Kale out of all of us can pull that off. <laughs> this is yeah. this is so yeah, Marco, Marco Yarich. Yarich. I would actually disagree that he is a good-looking guy, but what do I know? Okay, well, I don't think <laughs> any of us said that. Yeah, well, Milos, that we mentioned, Milos looks like he's just smoking heaters at all times. So <laughs> he does look like he's Vla- Vladi as well. Vladi definitely has that cigarette <laughs> smoker look to him. Yeah. So. Chain smoker, yeah. Okay, Adam, question number three for you. You're hanging on real nice. The last king of Yugoslavia, <laughs> Petar Karadjordjevic II, died in Denver, Colorado, Belgrade, Serbia, London, UK, or Buenos Aires, Argentina. I think I remember this from from a Serbian corner, and I think it was Denver. This was one of the connections. So I'm going to say Denver, Colorado. That's right. Smart people listen to Serbian corner. <laughs> and... <laughs> Welcome to Denver. Look at this beautiful photo. Is this is actually graphic? the first. This is actually the first Denver I've ever heard of as a kid. So I, I couldn't find a better photo. What, of Denver wait, than what's this. that? Wow. What is a it? photo of a dinosaur? Um, wow. Yeah, it's, what is the it's, name of that type of dinosaur? By the way, do you know? That it looks like a stegosaurus. No, oh, come on. Get oh, oh r- rhinoceros. No, no. Sorry, no rhinoceros. <laughs> is it the land before time guy? Is it? The... I'm not sure. I mean, he looks a bit like a. Parasaur- uh, yeah, para- that's just, what it is. Parasaurolophus. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, Parasaurolophus. Yeah, yeah. Nailed yeah. it. I'm not sure because because he's he's uh, how do you call that? Uh, it it should be backwards, not upwards. But that's what's a good you gonna point. do? It's yeah, a cartoon. Right. It's a cartoon. Come on. Yeah, Denver. Denver, the friendly dinosaur, or whatever it was called. Oh. Okay. Question Ooh. number four. Back to Brendan Vote. Serbia won the Eurovision Song Contest in two thousand three, two thousand seven. 2011 or 2015? Uh, my only experience with this is the highly underrated Will Ferrell film. Uh, so that's to say I have no clue, Miroslav. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Let's go with B. B, 2007. Damn you! That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. I Still actually that Vegas heater, baby. <laughs> I actually had the photo of the actual winner, wow. but I, I thought this would be more uh, perfect. How to say? Um, That's um, right. That yeah. movie is funny, by the way. It's a good. It's a good movie. Definitely it really is a good movie. movie. I've never yeah. even heard of this movie. Yeah, think about Will Ferrell. His his wife is from Sweden, and he was amazed by how how important the the Eurovision Song Contest is to all of Europe. Uh, every year, well, not all of Europe, but to a lot of people in Europe, and he just needed to make a movie about it. So, thank you. Yeah, Will. probably not going to go back and watch that one. Okay. Question number five: Harrison Wind. Yugoslavia won its third FIBA World Cup in 1998 in Athens, Greece. <laughs> Who was the coach of Team USA on that tournament? Ooh, George Carl. Trick question, I think. Rudy Tomjanovic. Lenny Wilkins or Chuck Daly? I think it's a t- I think it's a trick question. I was gonna say I don't think it was George Carl. I mean hmm. Chuck Daly, obviously dream team. Rudy Tomjanovich feels right. He's coming off of a couple championships. Stock was oh. high. 
Yeah, I guess I'll go. I guess I'll go B. I thought George Carl was 2002. That's why I think it's a trick question. That's right. There it is. Tom Janovich. He's not Tom Janovich. Come on. It's Tom Janovich. He is of Yugoslav descent. Yes, Rudy Tom Janovich. And you can see the guy on his right. His name is Kivain Garris. And he was the second. Looks like Shane Batty to me, yeah, but. <laughs> Number four. Yeah, I, who are you talking I, I don't about? think Shane Batty played on that tournament. Let me check. Just a little that bit looks little like Shane Batty. That's definitely that's Shane Batty. Yeah. That's one hundred percent Shane Batty. Not Shane Batty. Uh, <laughs> let me let me check that. I need to double check that because I'm pretty sure that's Shane Batty. If there's one like head I can recognize, it's definitely his <laughs> very unique head. Uh, okay. Shane I'm checking. Or... I'm double checking that. Wow, we're yeah. shook. I don't think um, you need to. I think you, that's you Shane can. <laughs> I mean, you can, but it's definitely Shane Battier, and there's Brad. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you, that's probably Chris Weber, number four. <laughs> number four, you're right. It's probably Chris Weber. And then in the back, we've got uh, Nate McMillan. Yep, that's Nate McMillan. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good job, guys. We named all the people. Yeah, yeah, th- th- that's the thing. Yeah, it is Shane Battier, but he didn't play on the 1998 team that was actually that was uh, obviously some other yeah that's that's Re- Brad I think Miller over there yeah was, you're right was yeah Serbian, okay Serbian yeah descent, the team so that played the sense. team that played on this uh, World Cup because it was uh, it was uh, uh, the lockout year so no NBA players and no top level mm. college prospects could have played on this tournament so uh, what I I said it was true the best player on the American team was called Wendell Alexis, and the second best player was Kivane Garris. And yeah. he is obviously not in this photo. Okay, question number six for Adam Mares. Most of the Serbian greatest players, up to something like eight years ago, played either for Partizan or Crvena Zvezda. Vlade Divac played for only Partizan, only Crvena Zvezda, both Partizan and Crvena Zvezda, or neither. Oof. How the hell would I know this? I mean, he had a long NBA career. I'm okay with that. He had a very long NBA career. I feel like Miroslav's selection bias leads to questions that are about partisan. I'm gonna go with. Oh, I'm gonna go with uh, a only partisan. <laughs> and he's off. And he's off. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here, dear. The real answer, he played for both Partizan and Crvena Zvezda. Truth be told, he really played for Partizan and he only competed in two EuroLeague games for Red Star during that during that uh, uh, lockout season. So he did appear on Red Star for a couple of games. Next and he question. was not married to Adriana. I, I, want record, was I want the record to show then technically I was correct. I wasn't technically accurate. Actually, but technically, tech, you were yeah, incorrect. But these, these games played. were official games, official EuroLeague official games. games. So, and actually, that same season, uh, Arvida Sabonis played for Zalgiris as well. So those were two really top-level stars playing in EuroLeague. And also Michael Olavo Candy, Candyman. So. The Candyman. Yeah, not not as big of a star like these two. Okay, question number seven. Back to Brendan Boat. <sighs> Former Denver Nugget Rastko Cvetkovic has won playing for the Yugoslav national team. Two FIBA gold medals, one FIBA World Cup gold medal, never played for the national team, or isn't a former Denver Nugget. <laughs> Let's go with D. D? D? And he's off! <laughs> and he's off! The right answer is he never played for the national team, but he did play for Denver Nuggets. And this is the highest resolution photo I could found of Rastko Cvetkovic. Wow. Adam is back with us. All right. We are, we are going back to question number eight. Harrison. Yes. Again, former Denver Nugget Predrag Savovic played for three seasons for which university? Oh, God. Hawaii, Marquette, Georgetown, Louisville. Now you see what you do to me, you guys, when you ask college <laughs> questions in the steps. So here you go. Uh, did not know that this guy was a former Nugget. 
There's um, no way he played in Hawaii, right? Come on. I'm going to say Marquette. That's a great guess, but I think it might be Georgetown. He's and out. He's out. And he's out. And he's out. He actually played at Hawaii. What? And yes, and yes, this is Brandon Vogt in Hawaii. Oh, I thought I recognized that. <laughs> I'm <laughs> such, I'm such a stalker, man. Life. I'm such a stalker. <laughs> such a stalker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question number nine. We're back with Adam Ares. <laughs> Former Laker Vladimir Radmanovic okay. was kick, no, kicked him. out of the Yugoslav national team on the FIBA World Cup in 2002 because wow. during oh, wow. a timeout, he was eating an apple, a protein bar, a banana, or a beef jerky. <laughs> wow. Uh, so None of these seem like offenses that you should be thrown out of. You've got protein, you've got energy. sugars. Um, when, when in this, oh, it's Adam's turn, my bad. Yeah, Adam. I, I think an apple would be the most disrespectful thing to see a person eating. So I'm going to guess apple. I, I can see that coming off as looking bad. And he's out. Please and tell he's me out. Beef jerky. Was it beef jerky? Yeah, the right text answer is a banana. What? And here is Vladimir Adnanovic. He's fighting um, off cramps. What if, yeah, what if he had a cramp? <laughs> Serbians don't get cramps though, right? <laughs> and for the final question, number 10, we'll, we'll let Adam come back. I mean... I need to be I need Thank to be you. kind to you guys. So question number 10 and this is for all three of you so make a make a, an answer together try to hit this one right. Final jeopardy. There have been 18 FIBA World Cup tournaments so far. Yugoslavia and USA combined for how many gold medals? 8, 10, 12 or 13. Uh, I'm going to guess 13. C or D because those are the two closest together there. Um. Yeah, I'd say thirteen. I'll go thirteen as well. I honestly didn't know the World Cup was a thing. I in two thousand two, I remember the U.S. lost, and I just remember being like, uh, "Whatever." But I didn't know like before that. I don't yeah, think after I knew it was a after thing. they lost in nineteen ninety eight as well. And I'll say they lost yeah. in ninety eight. Didn't in, even know that in in nineteen ninety as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so 13 is not the correct answer. The correct answer is actually only 10. Only 10. Both of mm. these teams have won five gold medals each, and I just put this random photo here yeah. from one of the just World Cups. I have no idea what this, where it went. Yeah, All right, 2002. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you okay, go. so next week. <laughs> Holy moly. Y'all gonna be here unless Lufthansa goes on strike. We're not flying Lufthansa. Actually, yeah, we're not so flying. Lufthansa. We're all that's good. Really, Go on that's, strike. Go. That's on strike. really smart. That's really smart. <laughs> Solidarity, baby. We don't care. Yeah. yeah. All right. That was great stuff, Miroslav. Thank you so much, buddy. Um, everybody, tune in tomorrow, two o'clock. Him and Voya gonna be breaking down some of the stuff for the national team. Yeah, we, we actually. Sorry, we're going to speak about Eurobasket. Do a real proper primer of the Eurobasket. We'll be talking about most of the teams about the favorites about the serbian team in detail so you want to go go and, and see us because it's going to be a great show about actual basketball and then next week of course miroslav is going to be with us for at least half of the trip uh, so a good portion of it you know he's going to be connected to us so looking forward to it thank you miroslav see you buddy on the other side guys john wallace departs what does that mean as well as joe conley we're going to talk about that and a couple other little items of news and note when we come back Guys, tomorrow, did you know the Broncos play tomorrow? The Broncos yep. play the Cowboys tomorrow in a preseason game. We have our first DNVR Broncos tailgate of the year. Make sure to get tickets to that. First of all, you can find it on the DNVR Sports Twitter page. It's pinned to the top. Just go there to get tickets. But you can get unlimited Breckenridge Brewery at tomorrow's Broncos tailgate. Breck Brew, the official beer of DNVR. You can get at the tailgate. If you're not local, if you're not in Denver, go on the Breck Brew beer locator. That will tell you where to get Breck Brew closest to you. Also, check out the Breck Brew seltzers. Perfect for the summer. The good company seltzers are awesome. Breck Brew's had them for a while now. Make sure to try those if you haven't. And again, pop into the tailgate. All the information is on the DNVR Sports Twitter page. First one of the year uh, tomorrow at Bronco Stadium. Should be a blast. Should be a blast if you're out there. Also, Sexy Pizza has been in the Denver community for 13 years. They're as local as it gets. Hand-tossed deck oven pizza with made-from-scratch each morning. 
dough. They've got tons of great pizzas. They've got tons of great sides, garlic knots, salads. They've got desserts as well. They've also got a portion of their pizzas are what they call their philanthropies. A portion of every sale from these five specialties pizzas are donated to a range of different nonprofits right here in Colorado. Order from any of their four Denver locations, Cap Hill, South Pearl, Jefferson Park, Park Hill, new location in Trinidad as well. Uh, order from Sexy Pizza. They're as local as they get. Great pizza, great sides, great food, great everything. So check Sexy Pizza out. All right, back here, final segment. Um, and we have some Nuggets news and notes. And it's funny, man. There's a lot of like peeling behind the curtain when people didn't see. Like I saw when the John Wallace news came out yesterday. You hop on Twitter, you hop on Reddit, and you start to see like the typical perspectives. Like, oh, another, you know, Cronky's letting somebody go. Nuggets cheap again, this or that. I don't know how fair or unfair that perspective is. I just want to note that that's always everybody's default perspective. Like if ever anybody leaves, it's always, oh, what a failure that so-and-so left. The John Wallace, well, like, and so with Joe Conley, Joe Conley's been around. I believe you could t correct me if I'm wrong, Harrison. Is Joe Conley, did he come over with Tim Conley in 2013? No, no. He, was, he came a few years after Tim got here originally. In the Conley family, there's four brothers. The Conley family has been around basketball, I mean, all their entire lives. Like, they're a family of basketball people. Uh, Dan Conley, I know, is a trainer who first got, you know, he was like one of Will Barton's first trainers back even in the Memphis days and even before that. So, or actually, I think it was in Memphis is when they first linked up. So, they're a family that has trainers, scouts, obviously front office people. They And they've been spread out. I know... What's the fourth Conley's name that's been in Phoenix for a while? Well, and Pat, like, Pat Conley, I think, is in Chicago now. And now in Chicago. You're right. That's exactly right. He is in Chicago um, now with Arturis. So they are a family of people that have been together. And Joe being you know, here, he's been on staff as a scout working alongside Tim, obviously, for the last several years. The fact that he departed, I don't think that should be surprising at all. It's literally his brother. And like his connection to Denver was largely with his brother. So that departure to me was sort of expected in a, in a weird way. There are ways yeah. I know that this breaks. Like when part of the story with Tim was that the news started to break shortly before the draft. So it was this thing of like, you know, now you got to get through the draft period. But the fact that Joe Conley left now to me is like not at all surprising. I kind of expected it. And you get through the urgent portion and, and now you move on. John Wallace to me is the more interesting one. He has been a rising star in the Nuggets organization since his arrival. Do you know the year of his arrival, Harrison? Of, it was like 2008. Uh, I think it was two years ago. Yeah, so 2020-ish, like he's relatively new. And in that short period of time, he's really risen. First off, he comes from Georgetown. He played basketball at Georgetown. He had a professional career, I believe, overseas, I, I believe. He played with Jeff Green at Georgetown. He played with Jeff Green at Georgetown, right. And he has a lot of connections. And as a matter of fact, I was told back when Jeff Green arrived that John had a big piece in recruiting him there from experience, saying like, hey, man, this organization – you know, there, there's some important things here. And that connection to Georgetown, there's actually been a few Georgetown connections over the last couple of years. Greg Whittington. Whittington. Greg, Greg Whittington. There you go. Yeah. The massive Greg Whittington pull. I'm serious. Um, <laughs> John Wallace, first, first and foremost, maybe the best basketball player on staff. You know, him and M Marty Poshis played at Duke um, and then played at Real Madrid as well as a bunch of other places in Europe. He's a fantastic basketball player as well. John Wallace, similar accolades, like a, a not just a division one player, but an impact player at Georgetown and then, a, and then a career and a guy that's still a, a really good basketball player. So when they have their runs, like those are the two guys along with Steven Graham, of course, who played in, had a cup of coffee in the NBA who like those guys, their, their experience playing basketball is really high. But what's interesting about John is that he has sort of, it seems from the outside and, and just from talking to people accelerated the, the timeline. I think he's a guy that we might hear a lot more of in the coming years, meaning he might be a guy that's on the fast track to being a GM at some point in the future. Do you, do you get that sense as well, Harrison? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Mike Singer, who reported this, said that he's going to be like the GM of the Timberwolves G League team as well, you know, in addition to his responsibilities with Minnesota. And yeah, I, I agree. When you talk to people about John Wallace when he was in Denver, they're like, oh, yeah, that guy could be a future GM. And, and this right. is when you know, he was pretty low level when, when he started out with the Nuggets, just, you know, as a scout and kind of doing a lot of different things and has moved up. But, you know, still 
wasn't, you know, top of the chain here in Denver, but yeah, a lot of people look at him as a guy with a lot of potential. And what's special about him, I think is obviously scouting is his forte, but he was a former player and it's sometimes rare to see like a front office guy have a super close relationship with a lot of players. Right. But he seemed like was able to bridge that gap yeah. where he was close with a lot of guys on this roster, particularly the guards, you know, Jamal Murray, Bones Highland, really everybody on, on, on this team, but particularly the guards. Cause that was the position he played, but the ability to relate to them, but also, you know, have just himself be really valuable from a scouting perspective was what was something that made him like a really strong front office guy. And I think the scouting part in particular, I just had heard he's a really good scout. Like he just, he has a good eye for these types of things. So going over there was the title. I don't even remember the title. He's going to be the director of scouting. Like it, it sounds like both moving, but also in a move up. Um, so we, yeah. so he's a, he's just a very talented one. I do feel like that one is one that, I don't know that it has an immediate and tangible like, oh, Denver just lost this thing. They're going to have to replace him. You know, they're going to have to move some other people to new roles or find people to fill those roles. But it is a guy that I think it's noteworthy that he was a fast riser and somebody that's kind of been everybody talking about is like, hey, that's a star in the making. And I think another aspect of this is, look, John Wallace and Joe Conley, those are Tim Connolly's guys. Oh, this he is brought him in, Tim- yeah. Connolly built out front office for the most part. Now, you know, it, it does suck to lose those guys. And just speaking about Joe Connolly, you have to give Joe Connolly a lot of credit for the Nuggets drafting Bones Highland. He was all in on Bones Highland, like a big proponent of him. Also, Tory Craig never becomes a Denver Nugget uh, if it's not yeah. for Joe Connolly. Joe Connolly, before he joined the Nuggets, coached Tory Craig in Australia. He's really the reason why Denver looked at him at all in that summer league. So you got to give him like a ton of credit on those two guys. There are other guys, of course, but those two in particular. Um, but now Calvin Booth kind of gets a chance to bring in two of his own guys. So mm. it's going to be interesting to see who he adds from that perspective. One other thing we keep hearing as we talk about like Tim and we've heard just so many different people talk about what was it that made Tim special or this or that. It was he really built the culture, but he also built the network here. Like he he it's not just that he picks players, which is what everybody looks at well, how come he didn't trade this guy, this or that? A president of basketball operations, the guy that's at the top, is really also determining how that organization operates. And I think John Wallace and Joe Conley are meaningful in a couple areas. One, of course, Joe Conley is connected to Baltimore and the East Coast, just like Tim Conley is, but also connected, to your point, to Australian basketball in, in that regard. So you kind of get a corner, like, do we have an expert in this part of the world? John Wallace, I think, was brought in for that reason. A player who's also one of those guys that just seems to know everyone, which is very valuable. And then on top of that, his scouting. So obviously you're hired because of your ability to identify talent, but there's a lot of guys that can do that. You don't want to have too much overlap of skill. You don't want to have any like dead spots. And I think that's the thing that John Walsh represented. If you look at a guy like Marty Poshis, his experience as well played at Duke. Okay. Prestigious or, you know, basket college basketball team. There's a whole, okay. You get access to a lot just through that. But then also coming from Lithuania, being playing for Real Madrid, now you get access to a whole group of people in, in that corner of the world. Rafael Juke, same thing. Like, okay, he's a scout in Europe, connected. You feel like, okay, I've got a, a – it's like Monopoly. I've got a hotel on European basketball grassroots. Like, we got something there. And yeah. all of the little pieces, I think that's one of the things Tim Conley did well is he had this um, front office that had a diversity of – of where they sort of touch what parts of the world they touch and you cover all bases. The nuggets still have that, by the way, they've got analytics in Lane Vatro, who I think is one of the you know more brilliant people in all of ba- sports analytics in the NBA. You got Dechi fall who is a, uh, comes from Senegal and is connected to African basketball and European basketball scouting and this or that, but very connected in that world. Um, you know, obviously Tommy Balchettis has grown to a bunch of different roles, started in analytics, but he too, coming from Lithuania, has a lot of these connections. So you just need different pieces of the puzzle. And that's what Tim Conley did a good job. And when you look at what was lost, I think less, oh, they're losing pieces. Tim Conley, they're paying more, they're this or that. And more, okay, the Nuggets may now have incomplete areas in certain parts of their front office. And let's see who they bring in and if they fit into the pieces that are perceived to be yeah. missing. 
Yeah. Like we know the Nuggets have a small operation. We've talked about that on this show. How many people total are in the Nuggets front office? Like you could maybe count like 10, you know? If, but if Harrison, you lose- but Harrison, you say that with a smirk, and I want to be dead serious about this. I honestly think it's a strength. There are front offices no. that have 50 people in them. There are analytics departments that have 20 people in them. And you there's a, there's a healthy amount to make sure you're doing the proper research, the proper scouting. Like there's a number for there. But then there's also just too many cooks in the kitchen. And I do think one of the things about the Nuggets front office under Tim Conley has been that it was small and agile and like everybody trusted each other and you could get in and have debate, but it wasn't overloaded. And no, I, totally. Because I, I see that comment a lot about, oh, Denver only has an analytics department of this many people. They only have this many scouts. And I just think there's a lot of teams that have 30 people in their analytics department. They suck. They're terrible. They're terrible organizations. And it's, spending money that way is not always smart. No, I wasn't saying that as a negative at all. All I'm saying is, now they have to replace 20% of their front office. Right, right. Like, like that's that's all I'm saying. They're going to bring in two new people. Right. That's, that's 20% of their entire staff. So it's any, any hire that Denver makes is pretty important just because whoever they bring in is going to have a voice. You know, like, I, like that's how Denver does things. It's a great I, – I, to me, listening to you guys talk about this, the, the perspective of – Booth hiring his guys here is to me what's really interesting. The direction he goes, what his network looks like. Um, does he fill, you know, both slots? Does does, does this department expand? Right. Does he go the other direction? So there's a lot of I think we've quickly gotten a taste of of how Calvin likes to operate. You can there's a chance of being naive when we haven't really seen a, a season unfold yet, but He's done a good job of, I think, laying out how he operates in, so far. And this will be another interesting data point. How does he want to fill this front office? Yeah, I, I, no question about it. And also, who is he capable of filling it? There's that. Sure. And yeah. this is the thing about Tim Conley is I just think he is somebody that knows everybody. And he's really good at that. And so his pool of who to pull from, like he's very good at kind of just reaching, knowing everyone and being able to say, okay, these are the guys, this guy can help me in this area that I'm needed. And I'm just curious to see what Calvin does with that. Um, I will say, I am interested to see how many more jump, how many more people go over. Because while I'm not surprised by Dan Conley, uh, who else has gone over? Well, there was, there's been a couple other prior to, to, to this one. Well, they, they tried to get Darrell Arthur. He ultimately yep. turned down the offer. And maybe Darrell Arthur does eventually get over there. I mean, we'll find out. I know Darrell Arthur really likes Colorado, and 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 so maybe that'll be a, a draw or a pull here. Um, obviously, I believe that there are some of the key members, including Calvin Booth of the front office. You know, they have uh, – we'll see what their future is and how the Cronkies handle that situation, who they extended for how long. Um, but – We'll, we'll see there is a number where too many people go and you have to like completely reset and it's a weird time there is like an institutional knowledge of people that have been here for long enough and right. i think that denver still has the appropriate amount to stay buoyant and to keep moving but you could perceive two three four more people go jump you know leaving and all of a sudden you're like hey we're at in winter now window and there's just not enough holdovers around so just something to kind of keep an eye on yeah i mean i think you can look at this and say some of it is probably expected, especially like Joe Conley. Just, I mean, (laughs) if you're Joe Conley, like it's just got to be a little awkward when you're just in the inner circle in Denver and your last name is Conley and your brother is running your biggest rival in Minnesota. Like maybe it'd be a little, maybe it'd be a little different if Tim was running like the wizards, you know, Right, right, right. he's right there in Minnesota. So, that's probably got to be a little awkward if you're Joe Connolly. So that, that was probably not that surprising. Um, but you can also probably look at this and say, it's not really going to matter on the court a ton for next season. And, you know, maybe even the season after that, like th- those guys are really valuable for scouting and, you know, scouting is the draft, but it's also trades and who we should acquire and, and stuff like that. But most of all, I'd say like the on-court product probably isn't suffering because of these moves. Right. No, right. but it is interesting to note how close we are to. It's not just the players, but the turnover in, in the front office. While I think this 
iteration has done a tremendous job in terms of finishing touches, just in terms of what got the Denver Nuggets from point A to point B outside of drafting Jokic, that just general sort of hive and and culture. And it, we've seen some pieces swap out and there probably is a threshold cross where whatever that identity is shifts. So, Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. I mean, like we, we've said this summer, how the we don't skip steps era is over. Like right. that, that, that version of the Nuggets is just done. Like Calvin mm-hmm. Booth is completely different from Tim Connolly. I, I think we're going to learn that more and more and more. And um, yeah, like everything that we knew about this team with Tim Connolly and how he handled it and the types of players he wanted, the types of moves he would make and wouldn't make. I feel like we have to throw all that out because this is a totally new front office. It, it, right. it just I, is. And I think we have to look at it that way. And I also, last thing I'll say on this topic is if you recall early on in, in um, Tim Conley's tenure here, a disproportionate amount of his moves were made between new Orleans. I think uh, Portland and uh, people connected to those places because he had connections there. And as your network expands, the more things that are available to you. And now, you know, Tim Conley's been at this a decade. Like, you know, his network is really large. Calvin Booth's been around the NBA. He, too, knows a lot of people there. So this is not necessarily a contrast between one guy and the other. Sure, it's sure. more of a note about the more people your front office knows personally, the easier it is to get deals done. And this is why you see so many different teams make deals with the same teams over and over and over again. And oftentimes it's because they have the ability and the relationship to just talk and say like, look, man, you're wanting Will Barton. Like he's a good player, but we don't want, you know, this is what we need. And it just makes it easier as opposed to the total game theory of, I don't know anyone over there. I can't show my hands. I have to do this thing. So just something to kind of note as Denver's departing, those are the, the mechanisms behind the scene that I think are, are kind of important. Um, Last thing, real quickly here. You guys didn't know I was going to talk about this. Um, there was a report today, and it was by, let me get the guy right. Oh, girl, right? Apologies. Sarah Todd, Desert News, who said that, who reporting that the NBA is open and a lot of people in front offices are lobbying for the NBA to swap free agency in the draft. I think this is the easiest and smartest move the NBA can do. And one of the reasons, the reason cited was that the penalties that the NBA is handing down now for tampering are so severe yet so seldomly enforced that you have this thing where you have to teams feel they have to tamper or else they're going to get left behind. But every now and then the NBA says you tampered and punishes someone somewhat indiscriminately, it would seem. And those teams end up getting severe penalties. And one of the reasons they say for that is free agency being first in the draft second you just feel like you have so much to, or, or I'm sorry, the other way around. You have so much that you have to get done and you're panicking and you can't wait. You can't be last. So swapping those things, the NBA apparently is lobbying for it and it makes sense. I wonder even if they can go further and put more distance there. The fact that they happen so quickly to me is always weird because like if you look at Utah right now, if the, if it started right now, would you trade Donovan Mitchell and you're doing a rebuild or would you try to bring in Donovan Mitchell help and, and, you know, go from there. If you strike out at one, then you could trade Donovan Mitchell and draft. It changes who you draft. If you're trying to win now, you know, it could throw things back where you end up drafting a player to win now. All of a sudden, Donovan Mitchell wants out anyway, and you lose him, and you just screw up. So it actually makes sense to me. I don't think it'll solve tampering, but I do think it might help teams better prepare for off seasons. Yeah, it is a little ridiculous when – the NBA finals finish up. And then like three days later, it's just the draft. (laughs) Like that's always been a little ridiculous to me. So in this scenario, would just, they not worry about tampering anymore? Would tampering just go away? (laughs) Because I'm, I'm in favor of any rule change calendar change that just eliminates uh, anybody caring about tampering. I don't, I wonder how it would work to be honest with you. Do you get, Tamper season, baby. Agency. Tampering is open for business. Let's tamper. I, Let's I'm with that. Tamper. Green light it. Who cares? It's Honestly, tampering. green like create a portion where what is it called the uh, moratorium? Well, yeah, what if the moratorium was just the tampering torium, <laughs> where <laughs> everybody just was free to tamper in these seven days? Perfect. And then you go into the draft after that. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it works out. But I just thought it was an interesting note that it's one of those things fans don't really think about, but it actually impacts teams more than people realize. So Mm -hmm. I just thought it was worth a comment guys. One week from today, we are going to be in Serbia. Actually at this very time, 
Uh, we'll, we'll be in Serbia in one week's time. I can't believe it. It's a little wild to think about, um, but I'm very excited about it. And I hope everybody listening to this and tuning into it is, is as excited as we are. We really want to make it a special once in a lifetime thing for us, but also a once in a lifetime thing for you guys. Um, that's certainly a thing D only DNVR would do. There's nobody else that would send seven people to Serbia just to learn about it. Um, DNVR is built different. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have a great weekend. We're going to see you on Monday, the week of the trip, next week. Hit that like button on the way out.